Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our Faculty of Agriculture and Food Sciences conversation series. My name is Nazem Chichek, and I'm the Associate Dean Research in the faculty. The title of today's seminar is Crops of the Future, Breeding for Value-Added Products. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba is located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties made on these territories, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So if you're new to the Faculty Conversation Series, this is our virtual seminar series that highlights some of our innovative research here at the faculty, and we try to do it in an engaging discussion format. If you have missed some of our previous seminars, uh, you have an opportunity to view them right here on our faculty's YouTube channel. And as another option, you can also find these uh, links to the seminars at our knowledge translation portal called the Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange, or MAKE. So makemanitoba.ca is a website that highlights our faculty's research as it relates to consumers and producers, with a variety of links to research uh, resources such as uh, podcasts, infographics, fact sheets, and even some recipes. Okay, so today we have three speakers who will share with us a short summary of their research and then engage together uh, in a conversation. You, as a viewer, can participate in this conversation by sending in your questions and comments uh, via the chat platform Slido. And right now, I'd like to call on Crystal Jorgensen, the faculty's communications specialist, to provide some guidance on how the audience can participate uh, in today's presentation. Crystal? Thanks, Nazem. Welcome, everybody. Really glad you can join us today. Um, as Nazem suggested, uh, to participate in today's session, we invite you to go to slido.com and enter the, uh, the access code hashtag future crops. That will get you into the, the chat Q&A format that we have. I will indicate that it's um, a kind of a succinct format, so try to keep your questions relatively short. The letter count is a little bit limited. Um, and we encourage you to start entering your questions at any time, um, starting now uh, and going through until we get to the Q&A portion at the end, and we'll try to answer them in order as they come in. Um, and finally, I think maybe just to kick us off, if you're on slido.com, uh, feel free to just let us know where you're watching from today. Back to you, Nazem. Hey, thanks, Crystal. So we will review those instructions again right before the Q&A section of the seminar. Uh, let's get right into it. So today's topic explores crops of the future, and specifically how crop breeding programs today are working to not only improve yield, but also to satisfy uh, many other demands. Uh, guided by producer and consumer needs, uh, breeders can target traits such as disease resistance, climate stress tolerance or uh, climate resilience, and nutritional quality. So they are also looking at specific ingredient needs and value-added considerations. Uh, researchers are concerned with end product quality ca characteristics such as uh, gluten protein quality in wheat. So these considerations can range from all the way from kernel properties to uh, actually baking and uh, they can play a significant role in uh, breeding cultivars that will achieve uh, Canadian registration. So the, today we will hear from three of our academics who work with major prairie crops like wheat and canola, and they will be sharing the goals, uh, challenges, uh, some of the opportunities they see in their respective disciplines, and how they are working to achieve tomorrow's crops. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, today's guests. So please welcome Kurt McCartney, who is an associate professor in uh, wheat breeding and genetics in the Department of Plant Science. He has studied various traits uh, in wheat and oat, including resistance to fusarium head blight, rusts, common bunt, and orange wheat blossom midge. He is breeding, uh, his breeding program focuses on development of winter wheat for the uh, Canada Western Red Winter Market class. So I want to turn it over to you, Kurt, to uh, introduce us a little bit to your research. Okay, thank you very much, Nazem. Um, yeah, as Nazem just stated, uh, my research is focused in, in three main areas, um, breeding winter wheat for the, the prairie region, 
of Canada. And another area we're working on is fusarium headlight resistance. And as part of that, we're, we're working with um, all the public sector and a number of the private sector uh, wheat breeders in, on the prairies, um, testing their breeding material for fusarium headlight resistance and getting that material um, evaluated and into the seed guides um, for farmers to, to access that information. And then the final part of my program deals with wheat genetics. And that is related to understanding the, the genetics of the, of the winter wheat crop primarily um, so that we can make um, uh, genetic gains uh, that'll be of use for farmers. And maybe I think, given that I'm one of the first people up talking, I thought it maybe could just briefly what, mention what plant breeding is. It, really what it, the process involves is cross-pollinating different uh, wheat lines, or in, the case, in, in my case, wheat lines or varieties. And then amongst the progeny from these uh, cross pollinations, we look for for plants that have superior uh, traits in in the in the progeny that are that are exceed the the current uh, varieties that are out there. And I guess maybe I should also maybe mention what a variety is for people who aren't familiar. These are genetically related individuals or plants. It's a genetic package that's sold uh, to farmers for for production. Um, it's analogous to a dog breed, um, so. You have different breeds of dogs, and likewise, we're creating new different breeds of, uh, of wheat. Um, and the farmers would then buy these for their for their particular needs on their farms. So, different growing regions in the prairies have different uh, environmental conditions, disease pressures, and they would have different varieties that would suit suit their individual farms. I guess in terms of traits, we're working on uh, obviously grain yields, probably by far and away the, the most important one. Um, but we're also working on improved adaptation. In the case of winter wheat, one of the most important ones is, is winter hardiness or winter survival. Um, winter wheat sown in the fall and it has to sur survive the winter in order to, to, to regrow in the spring and, and, and produce a crop. So survival is important. Another thing we're, I'm particularly interested in is alternative dwarfing genes for, for the crop. Um, the current dwarfing genes that reduce the, the height of the crop um, um, result in shorter um, uh, coleoptiles. That's the, the structure that uh, allows the wheat leaves to emerge from the soil after after sowing. And we want to have longer coleoptiles so they can seed the, the crop a bit deeper into the soil. Um, and then I guess disease resistance is very important. Fusarium head blight, it's probably the most important disease in, in, in wheat in Canada and, and probably in the world. Um, and then there's also the rust diseases are very important for, for farmers in, in Canada too. So shrape rust is more important in Alberta and leaf and stem rust are more important in Manitoba. Um, and then finally, grain quality. Um, really for the breeding program that I'm working with, that we are trying to develop wheat um, varieties that meet the Canada Western Red Winter Market class. So there's a whole number of different um, quality parameters that uh, the grain has to, to meet in order to be registered in that market class uh, so that the, 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 the people buying the grain um, would know that, that the wheat would meet their, their expectations. And then I guess the genetic research involves understanding the, all these different traits I just mentioned and uh, using that information for making the breeding program more efficient and increase the likelihood of producing um, better varieties. And as part of that, we'll, that allows us to improve the breeding methods and develop DNA markers and, and also DNA sequencing uh, technologies and apply them into the breeding program. So I think that's it for me. Um, I'm back to you, Nazem. Okay, thanks, Kurt. That was excellent. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, next up, we welcome Manika Malgoda, who's an assistant professor in grain chemistry and processing quality in the Department of Food and Human Nutritional Sciences. And Manika's research uh, focuses on grain protein and starch physical chemical properties and their impact on end use quality, uh, food applications of underutilized grains, and the biologic, biological activity of grains. And Manika currently supports the winter wheat breeding program at the U of M through quality analysis of breeding lions. So please go ahead, Manika. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Na thank you, Nazim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Nazim just mentioned, my name is Manika Malagoda. I am the PI of the Grain Chemistry and Processing Quality Lab here at the U of M. My research spans uh, across multiple areas in grain science, so to say. We look at grain chemistry, specifically starch and protein chemistry. Protein plays uh, an essential role in wheat quality. Therefore, we, uh, we focus a lot on uh, uh, wheat protein, especially gluten proteins. On the other hand, we are studying processing. In the case of processing, we are looking at um, milling uh, capacity and then uh, increasing milling efficiency and on the biological activity end we'd like to focus on uh, further understanding the importance of whole grains uh, from a nutritional standpoint to give you an idea of what's currently going on uh, in my group uh, we are doing a couple of projects uh, on wheat oat and also intermediate wheat grass a perennial grain in the case of wheat, wheat is a major crop to Manitoba and to Canada. We are currently studying quality characteristics ranging from kernel quality all the way to baking. And then we are also uh, studying uh, acrylamide formation uh, during wheat-based wheat product processing and identifying how we could reduce the uh, acrylamide formation during the processing of uh, wheat-based products. So there's a lot of uh, work going on on the wheat end, and you'll hear more about that um, as we go along in, in this uh, conversation. With regard to other research, I'm also doing some work on oat. We are studying oat protein specifically. Uh, we are currently conducting a study where we are looking at oat cultivars from multiple regions across the prairies and looking at how they are protein extraction efficiency varies and also how their protein functionality and the structural properties vary uh, with regard to where the cultivars are grown. We are also trying to identify specific proteins that are important in oat protein functionality, thereby contribute to uh, oat breeding in terms of breeding for uh, oat cultivars that are uh, highly functional. Uh, on the other hand, we are working on perennial grains, especially intermediate wheat grass. Uh, intermediate wheat grass has a lot of environmental benefits, especially uh, on the soil end. So currently we are investigating how to process intermediate wheat grass, whether it's milling or co-milling with a, another uh, grain is a good option and also identify uh, different food applications for intermediate wheat grass, which would we could range from pan bread to um, uh, flat bread. So again, we are looking at multiple applications there. And we also have a focus on ancient grains, especially iron corn and emma. And again, we are trying to see how we can utilize these grains in a more efficient manner. Overall, the goal of the research program uh, is to make sure that the grains that grains and the grain-based products that you consume are safe, healthy, and of course, flavorful and you know pleasing to you as a consumer. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, back to you, Nazim. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Monika. That was excellent. Um, we have uh, our next guest up, and we welcome Rob Duncan, who's a professor in canola rapeseed breeding in the Department of Plant Science. Uh, Rob grew up on a seed production farm near Miami in Manitoba and has experience in breeding common bean, wheat, and uh, canola. His current breeding program uh, focuses on the improvement of high uric uh, uric uh, acid rapeseed cultivars for Western Canada. So I'll turn it over to you, Rob. Thanks, Nazem. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about uh, our research in the Brassica breeding program and specifically today to discussing breeding value-added products. So before I even start, I have to highlight the amazing team of technicians and students that we have in our breeding program in the field, the greenhouse, the seed quality lab, data analysis, molecular lab, and, and doubled haploid lab. These are the scientists who, who really make our research possible. Uh, I also wanna thank our uh, numerous collaborators and our sources of support, including NSERT, the Canola Council of Canada, Manitoba Canola Growers, Bungie, Nutrien, and, and DL Seeds. So we often term our group the Brassica Breeding Program, and, and I do that because 
We work with numerous brassica species in the brassica breeding program. And not all of these species fit the traditional canola quality definition or the definitions for rapeseed or higher usic acid rapeseed. So that's why we often refer to ourselves as the brassica breeding program. Our current research really focuses on a wide range of agronomic seed quality, disease resistance, and overall trait improvement in canola or higher usic acid rapeseed. And at any one time, we could be selecting for over a dozen traits or characteristics in those genotypes in the field. So the core of the breeding program really focuses on developing high erucic acid rapeseed cultivars that are growing in Western Canada. The oil extracted from this seed is utilized in lubricants, slip agents, and numerous household products. So these dozen or more characteristics can include yield and disease resistance, as already mentioned, or oil content and quality, just to name a few. Many of our graduate students that are working in, in our breeding program center their research on the genetics behind one or more of these traits and are looking often to improve some of these traits. So the graduate students in our research are really the trait developers. Now, overall, the main goal in our, in our research and, and, and how I, I try to frame things is, is to improve the economic and environmental efficiency of canola and rapeseed production in Canada. Now, we could accomplish this by focusing on traditional traits such as yield or disease resistance. But in recent years, we've directed research efforts to adding value to the crop. So what I mean by that concept is that we want to utilize the entire plant and the entire seed, not just one component of the seed. And that's traditionally been done with the main product coming from canola production being oil. So as an example, what if we could utilize the stem or stubble after harvesting the seed? Likewise, what if the meal or the co-product with, what if the meal was a co-product with the oil rather than being kind of a lower value byproduct? In this scenario, the farmers would have three main products coming from the growth of their crop rather than just the traditional oil as the main product. So in doing this, we would be using the time of the growing season and the space of the land in a more efficient manner. Of course, adding these traits on to uh, additional traits is no easy task. It means adding more and more on uh, in, into the selection of our parents and our hybrids on top of those dozen traits that I already mentioned. So as an example, it would mean breeders would have to develop protein contents or seed qualities that add value to down, downstream processing, making that downstream processing more efficient. Or breeders would have to modify the stem characteristics, whether that's the cellulose content or the lignin content, uh, so that it was more appropriate for certain end uses. So adding on all these traits would introduce many challenges, both genetically and logistically. But it's so exciting to see the potential that there is to add further value to canola production in Canada. I'll maybe end it there, Nazem, and we can discuss further and address any questions. Yeah, thanks, Rob. That was excellent as well. And uh, it leads me right into our next portion of our conversation, which really is uh, to bring you all uh, back to the table and discuss a little bit uh, how you see your breeding programs really addressing this value added needs that producers and uh, processors and, and consumers are looking for value addition, and what that really means to, uh, uh, to the group. I, I know we covered uh, varieties from canola, winter wheat, uh, you know, uh, perennial grains, oats, and so forth. And I'm sure there's different lessons to be learned, but right across the spectrum, there's this notion that we can add value. So what does that really mean? Maybe we can get a bit deeper into that. And uh, I'll start with Kurt this time. Um, how does your uh, plant breeding program fit into this value added products uh, notion? Well, I think uh, in the case of wheat and uh, I guess in my case, winter wheat, uh, wheat is really produced as a commodity for the most part. Uh, there are specific wheat market classes where varieties get registered into and they, they get segregated at an elevator into these uh, market classes. So I think there's two main avenues for 
value-added products in wheat. Um, one would be moving sort of the target for a particular market class in a different direction, and all the varieties that get registered in that class would, would move along with it over time. That would be one main mechanism, and that would, say, the, the red winter um, market class would have improved quality as a, as a whole with all the varieties in it. Another mechanism would be um, through the spe special purpose weeds, or yeah, yeah, I believe that's what they're called, special purpose market class. The, this is really a feed weed, ethanol wheat sort of class that really has no quality constraints to it at all. And you could have a really high value um, wheat variety that ha would have excellent grain milling properties put into that class. It just didn't fit into any, any of the other market classes and it could be grown in a contract system um, and, and, and that value captured in that mechanism. Right, it serves the ethanol industry, for example, specifically. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Rob, you mentioned quite a bit uh, already in, in your uh, intro about using the entire plant, you know, um, taking advantage of the fiber and the protein. Uh, can you maybe get a bit more into detail on that, how that improves the overall value, particularly as it relates to uh, what is the, uh, the mechanisms you would breed, for example, for a particular kind of fiber? or uh, looking more specifically to protein rather than oil? Yeah, so I, I thanks Nazem. I, I guess the way I would see things is obviously we need to maintain that that oil as, as one, of the, one of the main products from the system. But if we could add on uh, increased value from from the stem or stubble, and, and it definitely adds value going back into the soil as well. But if we were able to repurpose that, for whether it was some type of composite or whether uh, a, a different purpose um, and also increase the value of the meal where normally canola meal is, is dedicated to feed for, for the dairy industry. If you were able to find a higher value source then all of a sudden that canola crop that's coming off the same land size, maybe with the same amount of inputs, the same amount of energy, all of a sudden you have I'm not saying that you would triple, but all of a sudden you've got three streams of, of products coming off of there. So in terms of the fiber aspect, what that would involve specific to your question, really what that would mean is, and we're working with researchers in biosystems, um, Ashir Raman has, has driven a lot of this and Jason Morrison and Danny Manor working on it. And and what we're really looking at is, is utilizing the variation within the brassica species and trying to right now at the very early stages of this process, looking at what uh, maybe what genotypes or what characteristics in some of this diversities of diversity of the species is, is more suited to uh, with, uh, a particular textile industry or a non-textile industry. That's very interesting. Thanks for that. And and Manika, you mentioned um, in your intro that you work with perennial grains and winter wheat and uh, and even oats and, and so forth to, to look at maybe some of the characteristics that affect baking and the utilization of that in, in uh, food products. Can you expand on that a little bit? How do you work with breeders to uh, maybe uh, look at some quality char characteristics that are important to you? Sure. Uh, so I'll... I'll talk to the talk about the winter wheat breeding program here. So currently winter wheat is used for flatbread, but there are more market opportunities, especially worldwide, maybe steamed bread or noodle type products. So if we could identify what properties are related to making a, a flatbread or, or a steamed bun, Maybe that's a starting point for us to further expand our market opportunities globally and maybe reach out to markets elsewhere uh, rather than just waiting in our current space. So that's definitely what I take from a value adding, especially in the case of winter wheat. So to answer your question about working with uh, breeders, I'm currently working with Kurt. We are analyzing quality for uh, samples coming from his breeding program. And uh, with regard to oat, uh, we are also uh, working with breeders there. So we are analyzing samples, not just the, sorry, analyzing cultivars that are not just the standards, but also uh, cultivars that are in the breeding program. 
So that gives us the opportunity to look at these advanced breeding lines and maybe think about which applications they would be more suitable for. Is it a beverage or maybe it's just a protein isolate, protein concentrate? So definitely working with uh, advanced breeding lines or samples from breeding programs gives us the opportunity to really look beyond the current market and see where we could expand. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Very good. And now, you know, some of you have mentioned sort of the um, some of the challenges that are associated with the current environment, uh, which relates to environmental sustainability and uh, making sure that, uh, you know, we, we breed it with that in mind. With some uh, we mentioned climate resilience uh, and so forth. Is, is there a room for that in your breeding programs? How do you address some of the sort of broader societal uh, streams that are that are with us? Maybe I'll start with Rob in this case. Do you do you feel that uh, that's uh, certain uh, that's coming into the picture as you as you uh, progress in your breeding program? Definitely, I think whether whether it's an abiotic stress tolerance to drought or to excess moisture, um, those are those are traits that can definitely add value to to the crop with with a changing environment. Uh, so working closely with Dr. Claudio Stasola. On, on this research topic. Um, I think anywhere you can be um, with lower inputs or lower energy in input costs, and but keeping your, your production levels the same, if you can work towards that tar target, I mean, essentially you are, you're adding value to that crop. And so whether that's reducing fertilizer inputs or chemical inputs or irrigation inputs, I, I think, and still trying to maintain that variety. And I mean, the genetics of, of the cultivars that are being grown are, are going to play a, a, a good portion of, of that role in maintaining that production. I think you're, you're, that's another group or category of of adding value to that crop. Great, thanks. And and Kurt, can you address this challenges that you might face uh, bringing sort of these new varieties to market? Is there um, specific things that you can point to there? Well, I think the the uh, constraints for the the registration system, I, I think, uh, would be the the main the main issues. I, I think uh, you do have to produce varieties that fit within these parameters that are kind of drawn out or really like a bullseye for each market class. You have to fit fit the variety into that. Or you're going the, al the alternate route of the special purpose class for for wheat. Um, I think that would be the, the main thing. Um, I maybe I wouldn't mind touching on the question you just asked, asked Rob. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the the changing environment is very important. And that's probably something I'm working, spending more time focusing on then then value added products in, in wheat. I think the, the changing environment's critically important. Um, winters are getting shorter, more mild. And I think in the case of winter wheat, that creates opportunity that really didn't exist, say 15, 20 years ago. Uh, there's now possibility of better winter survival um, and increased out, 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 out of or adoption by farmers for, for growing winter weeds, I think. Um, and I think the, the final bit is with winter wheat that it's going to be over the long term very interesting to watch will be how it compares to spring wheat with the changing environment um, and changing precipitation patterns. The past couple of years we've had or have been very dry in July and August and and winter wheat has, has done comparatively better because it, it ripens a lot earlier than spring wheat does. So I, I don't know where it's all going to end up, but I think it's something we having some activity in winter wheat breeding is, is really important for having that uh, flexibility for the for farmers uh, for adapting to climate change. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly see that the uh, variation in climate is is with us, right? So that's not going away and we'll have to adapt. Uh, Monique, I wanted to touch base on uh, the idea of wheat-based protein. And I know you've done some work in that and we know how important uh, the protein industry is nowadays in the prairies and in Manitoba specifically. Um, What's your work tell us about uh, protein from wheat? Oh, you're muted at the moment. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Protein from wheat would mainly be the gluten proteins. So gluten functionality is very important in products like bread and so on. On the other hand, uh, when we are looking at gluten proteins, there's an issue of allergenicity too. 
this is something that um, I have uh, looked at in the past. So uh, I think from a value added perspective, with regard to gluten, my work mainly focuses on um, understanding how protein composition is associated with different products. Protein composition important for uh, that is needed for pan bread could be different to what is needed for a product like noodles. Okay. So again, um, my work mainly focuses on that. And I think uh, what I'm trying to say is we are looking on the chemistry end to identify what requirements we need to meet in order to make the product uh, that the global market needs. So that's that's basically uh, what, what we are trying to do. Okay, very interesting. And talking about protein, you know, we all know about pea protein in the province and uh, soy-based protein. Uh, Rob, you mentioned a little bit about canola protein as well. Um, is that uh, something that humans can consume? Is that part of the mix when we talk about plant, plant protein at the moment, or is that, uh, is that is there potential there? Definitely part of the mix when we're talking about plant protein. Uh, so canola protein actually has a, a well-balanced amino acid profile. Okay. Um, Merit Functional Foods actually has multiple canola protein products. One of them is a blend with, with pea as you mentioned, uh, but there are numerous products and, and some of the basis for some of those products is, is uh, kind of the two main seed storage protein types in canola. Those two types are cruciferin and napin, and they both have different functional properties. So you could create different um, protein extracts or, or isolates based upon those two main functional characteristics. And so um, they, can, they can be used in, depending upon the functional properties, in um, different protein powders, in, in meat analogs, in shakes, in, in baking, different, different uses depending upon their characteristics. So I'm very optimistic about the potential for adding value to the canola meal by utilizing it as a food source rather than, than, than a feed source. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's going to be important, right, as uh, we transition away or towards more plant protein consumption, and it's got to go beyond feed and into the human market. So that's, I think that's a, a brilliant opportunity there for sure. Uh, yeah. Kurt, when you think about uh, breeding for disease resistance, you mentioned that uh, as well. Is, is, there, is there a connection there with value addition? So if you, if you think about uh, resilience in the face of, um, obviously, uh, diseases that might now be uh, you know, out there because of climate change or climate variability, more moisture or uh, you know, higher temperatures, and uh, does, that, does that correlate with uh, this, this whole notion of breeding for value addition? Yeah, it does, and it may be a different mechanism. Um, disease resistance is really important for maintaining yield um, in the what in the presence of these diseases. Uh, almost all of the diseases for wheat are caused by fungi, and the infection process involves having in, it happens in environments where there's lots of water. So in a drought year, you're not going to have much problem with diseases, but uh, in a wet year, you you can have significant problems. Um, different parts of the prairies have different disease issues, um, and the farmers there are, are quite familiar with what, what they're facing in the fields each year, and uh, they've developed sort of, I guess, methods and, and strategies for, for mitigating these diseases. But the varieties themselves can range quite drastically in the level of resistance to individual diseases, and uh, there's opportunities for, for saving money for, in terms of losses and, and losses in grain quality but also in redu reduction of fungicide use. And in particular, I guess with Fusarium head blight resistance, um, what would be really nice would be get to a point where we have strong enough resistance that a fungicide wouldn't be needed to for controlling that particular disease. That would be a, a really long-term goal, I think all the wheat breeders are, are working toward. Great. Uh, I, I understand we have some questions, uh, which is great uh, from our audience. So uh, uh, before we move to that, maybe Crystal can remind us one more time how you uh, can share your questions with the group, and then we can move right into uh, maybe posing some of those questions. Uh, Crystal? Yeah, thanks, Nazem. Uh, so yeah, just a reminder that our Q&A platform is slido.com. So if you can open another tab in your browser and just jump into slido.com, that the uh, entry code is hashtag future crops. 
Um, again, just uh, be succinct, enter your questions. We'll try to answer them in order. And uh, just before we get started, I had asked where people were watching from. And we've got viewers from Winnipeg, Notre Dame, Winkler, Sandy Bay, Saskatchewan. Um, so I think I'll just turn it over to you, Nazem. And I don't know if you want to start with um, the first question. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's do that. Our first question here is from Patty Rosher. And it is, uh, um, let me just make sure I read that. I, what is your hope for the seed regulatory modernization discussion? What would be a meaningful outcome for breeders? So who wants to take that on? Go ahead, Kurt. <laughs> Might be more applicable on the wheat side. Well, yeah, those, those discussions were interesting. And I, I'm not really sure what the, the direction was intended for those discussions. It, I'm, 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 I feel like I was a little bit unsure of what, where this was going to go and uh, where it is going and what the motivation for, for those discussions were. Um, I feel like the current registration process for wheat is quite flexible and uh, I don't see much issue. I think we're, we're meeting the demands of, of the, the buyers and there's quite a bit of flexibility for, for public and private sectors uh, to be breeding in, in, in wheat in Canada. So I, I don't, I'm not entirely certain what the issues truly were specific to wheat anyway. Okay, that's good to know that you're happy with the current system uh, uh, generally. So I'll hop on to the next one here. This is to Rob. Uh, is there promise on modified brassica oils as low C emission biofuels, so low carbon emission biofuels? If so, is there potential for it to be involved uh, in your future research? Would you be considering that as a research project or program? Rob. Yeah, good, good question. There's definitely potential for it. And there are research groups in, in Canada, different parts of the world, Spain, uh, that are that are looking at it for uh, different brassica species for different biofuel purposes, whether that's in the aviation industry or, or elsewhere. So definitely potential for it. Uh, as uh, definitely potential within our research program at the University of Manitoba. I mean, we do focus on on the erucic acid component, which is a, a high, high value component and mainly used as, as, a, as a lubricant or a slip agent rather than a, a fuel per se. Um, but definitely potential for it. And, you know, as, as the market developed or if different industries were, were relying on or, or requiring that, um, I think we'd be able to make that switch very quickly because we were, are working more on an industrial oil rather than a than a food oil thanks for that rob okay on to our next one here i have a question from jared bento jared asks with the rise of interest in intercropping i was wondering if there is any formal collaboration between breeders of different crops with intercropping in mind who wants to take that on I, I can start if that's okay. Thanks, Jared. Appreciate the question. I think there's definitely collaboration between breeders in, in different crops. I think it is an area where more emphasis can be be put for sure. For example, whether that's canola and peas all in, in the same crop. And and I I did have that in, in the kind of preparation for this as you know, one area of adding value to a crop or improve as i mentioned earlier improving that efficiency of a, of a certain time period or a certain land base if you're utilizing that um, space and time better as an intercrop or as a double crop i mean that's ultimately improving the the efficiencies of your inputs um, the crops maybe will have the two different species may have some synergistic effects and so I think that is an area moving forward where in Western Canada more focus can be put. Yeah, thanks for that. And I know we have researchers in the faculty that work on a variety of cropping systems, polycropping, intercropping, make sure there's cover cropping research also and in you know, rotation work. So um, there is certainly room for our breeding community to in interact with our agronomic sciences community and, and see how uh, some of those uh, new lines uh, can be used in those new systems and innovative systems, all in, you know, 
uh, with an eye towards more sustainable and resilient production, right? All right, I do have another question here from uh, Jacob uh, Colodi. J Jacob asks, Dr. Duncan, this is, I guess, to Rob, are there currently any specific companies interested in using canola stems for fiber? Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Uh, th th there are. Um, it's, it's quite exciting. Again, a lot of this research systems engineering there. Um, I, I'd put the potential uses for fiber coming from um, canola in kind of two broad categories of kind of possibly a textile based one and then a non textile based category. And so there is some interest in the in the textile side of things. And so we're, we're again, we're at the initial stages of this this research, but just evaluating the variation, the properties in in different stems, um, whether it's contents of different components or, or lengths and the softness, all sorts of criteria to determine whether those fibers can be woven and utilized in an apparel apparel based um, product. Uh, but I think there's great potential too from from in the non um, textile side of things, whether it's used as, as a composite, for example, as an absorbent or in a ceiling tile. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite excited about where uh, the potential for, for moving forward in, in this field. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. And I, I know that that group has done work with different fiber in the past with cattail fiber and, and looked at uh, some of that, you know, as a potential for textile replacement, cotton replacement. So that's very interesting work. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, maybe pose a question myself, and this could go to anybody who wants to take it on. I, I, I think I'm more thinking about uh, Manika here. This is with sort of the underutilized grains. You mentioned a little bit about the ancient grains and intermediate uh, wheatgrass and so forth. Um, can you talk about uh, how you would assess the quality of those grains? Is this Do you assess them the same way as you would with any wheat, or is there specific things you're looking at there? when you are looking at these kind of new varieties or, um, you know, kind of uh, non-conventional varieties? Yes. Uh, so to start with, we, we look at the uh, grains with the methods that we use for wheat. However, mm -hmm. there's a lot of optimization that goes in with regard to the maybe parameters that we are using. Or if for, for most of these uh, grains and products that we hope to develop, we use a blend of wheat and whatever ancient grain or um, maybe intermediate wheat grass flour that we are using. So in that case, we look at what the optimum blend would be, because what we hope to gain is a product that com consumers would would like. Right. So to go back to your question, we do start with the, uh, the wheat quality testing methods, but again, we optimize uh, based on the products that we have in mind. Okay. Thanks. And uh, maybe this goes to Kurt or to all of you. Do you do you feel that your programs have specific challenges when it comes to uh, variety breeding? Uh, what would you like to see change if, um, you know, whether that's through uh, the commercialization pathway, we address that a little bit, but generally what is uh, kind of limiting you in, in your research at the moment? If you can point to some challenges. Hmm. Kurt, Rob, go ahead. I think one thing that I... I don't know if it's a really a, a challenge or, or not, but it, it, it's maybe clarity on uh, CFIA's position on PNTs and um, and um, genome or gene editing technology and where that's all going to fit in. And, I, and perhaps, I guess maybe my per perspective would be nice to see if um, Canadian um, requirements or legislation in this area are more harmonized with other countries in the world. Right now, we are a little bit different in terms of how we treat particularly um, um, transgenic crops compared to other countries. And and uh, I think with genetic engineering, I think uh, it would just be nice to know what direction that's going because we're getting a lot, a lot more information on genetics and the specific genes we're involved in in many traits. And there's lots of opportunities now for for using that type of technology for basically modifying the expression of a, a gene of interest or, or eliminating the, the expression of a particular gene, which could have beneficial uh, effects on, on, on the crop. So I think that'd be one thing. It's not really a, a con 
maybe a, a limitation or a concern at the moment, but it's something I think looking to the future, it'd be nice to have some clarity and for for knowing how to how to utilize these technologies in the future. Is that the CRISPR technology we're talking about when you talk about gene editing? Uh, yeah, that would be the main one that's used for, for that. And then right now it's still very extremely valuable for doing genetic research and understanding um, the control of, of traits of interest. But in terms of applying them to the crop, I think people are a little bit, or the breeders are, are a little bit uh, reluctant to, to go too far into it because uh, we're just not sure where, what direction that's ultimately going to go. Yeah, and what it means to the consumer ultimately and what markets would accept that variety, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's certainly something that uh, needs to be established. Uh, anything else? Any other challenges you can point to, Rob, in your field? Do you feel that uh, there's something that could be done differently or better to uh, to get things going a bit more quickly? Yeah, I, I just say in terms of challenges uh, along this line of value-added products, I mean, the, the challenge often is that, I mean, if if we were to do what I am uh, talking about here, I mean, you're adding additional traits on it. it just makes everything grow and become more difficult and larger numbers. On top of that, we're talking about developing markets kind of at, at the same time. And so it's if we're talking about a specific end product, that the whole value chain for that, whether it's a fiber or human food use for the meal kind of has to develop at the at the same time. That's always very challenging. Um, from a breeding standpoint, a direct challenge, the biggest challenge I have is, is uh, evaluating for whether we're talking about a fiber trait or a meal trait, a protein related trait is evaluating many, many samples in a rapid period of time with a small sample size. That's probably my biggest limitation in a, in a breeding program. Um, because we can we can do a, a lot of wonderful assays and, and determine whether it's amino acid profile or cruciferin content, but they're time consuming. Sometimes they need large amounts of seed. And a lot of the breeding progress that we've made in many crops and, and for any traits is due to the fact that kind of simultaneously or, or a key part in that process was that an assay or a test was developed where you could rapidly evaluate a small amount of, of the, the product that was needed. And so those are things that kind of has to develop at the same time for the breeders to make progress. Yeah, you can get a lot of varieties going, but if you can't have the analytical tools to kind of understand what's exactly going on, right? And the high throughput tools. Yeah. Maybe that has to catch up a little bit. That makes sense. Um, I do have another question here posed by the audience, so maybe I'll jump onto that. This is to Manika. Uh, do you also look at barley grains potential for human consumption? Do you do any work with barley? Uh, not right now, but if there's an interest, um, that is definitely within my area of expertise. Uh, we can not only look at barley from for a food uh, purpose, but we could also... And I think this needs in, uh, further studies, look at barley from an allerg allergenic perspective, because again, barley also has allergens. So again, um, if there's interest and, um, you know, if we, we, all, we like our research to be um, innovative and actually serving the community. So if there's interest, uh, we are definitely open to working on uh, barley and any other grain for that matter. Yeah, thanks, Monika. I'm certainly interested in barley, the liquid versions of it, and I, I wouldn't want to have any allergies. I enjoy that. Um, I do have another question here. Uh, yeah, and it says, how can we incorporate other healthier grains into baked products without adversely, adversely affecting the superior gluten properties of wheat? I guess this goes to Manika as well. Mm -hmm. So like and I said earlier, uh, gluten plays a major role in wheat functionality. So one of the major challenges of incorporating other grain-based ingredients is maintaining that functionality without gluten. So there are a couple of things we can do uh, with regard to addressing this challenge. Ingredient formulation, can, sorry, product formulation can be uh, optimized. We can include products like hydrocolloids or emulsifiers to make the product um, better also on the pro also on the processing end we can identify um, the best processing conditions and this could start 
from milling itself, what particle size may be best for this type of product. So definitely there are challenges in replacing wheat with other uh, grains that do not contain gluten. But, you know, this is still doable uh, if we look at um, gluten free, free products. And these products have very much improved over the years. So ingredient technology plays a major role there. So we have uh, many different ingredients that we can work with in order to make products that uh, consumers like. Right. You know, I, I think it when gluten free products came, first came on the market, uh, people were joking that gluten must mean uh, deliciousness because, you know, they lost all the. Uh, the benefits they would get from eating that product, you know, but that has changed. Certainly, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I recognize now that uh, consumer preference is, is a huge part of developing new products, right? So it's, oh, sure. it's got to be palatable. Uh, I do have another question here from uh, Stephen Fox. Um, how do you balance competing interests for value added or changing values? For example, oil for food or oil for fuel? So maybe we'll give Rob the first uh, stab at that since he works with uh, oil seeds. Go ahead. Thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, that's a great question. It, it is, a, is a difficult balance, I guess, where, and, and because of that, where, I mean, that oil for food from our canola production in, in Canada is, is so, so critical. And, and for that reason, I'd, I'd prefer not to interfere or, or have a competing interest with that uh, that f oil for food. But in addition to that, if we can utilize the plant better or the, the meal after the oil extraction better, um, I think that's where we can really add value in that manner where we are not competing um, per se, uh, because it is a difficult challenge to take away oil from, from the food sector to, to the fuel side of, of things. So I'd prefer to keep them separate and, and keep that food component and add, add value with some of the other products that are coming out of the production system. Right. And I, I guess we could uh, even look at ethanol from uh, wheat or corn, you know, first generation biofuels. We have that food versus fuel challenge and the balance right. there. And, and Kurt mentioned that briefly that you could uh, breed for, uh, for ethanol specific crops, I guess, or wheat. And, uh, you know, one has to be careful about the balance of what we dedicate our land and effort to, right? But, Kurt, did you want to address that at all? What would one look at when you are breeding, particularly for a biofuel like ethanol? Well, I think it needs to be high yielding. I think that's the, the main thing is lots of starch. Um, and I think uh, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of future in that area in, in the wheat side of things. Um, I think it seems like based on the car manufacturers, the, the direction is electric vehicles. And uh, I don't know if given the timeframes of breeding uh, being 10 to 15 years before you have a product from the initial cross pollinations you make. Um, I don't know if there'd be much point in going down that direction at this point in time. Food is definitely needed and uh, we want to utilize the land for, for, for food, I believe. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, and I, uh, I, do have a bit of background no it's good yeah I agree I think that's uh, I think that's been resolved now most of the biofuel plants that are coming online are second or third generation looking at waste rather than food as a as a feedstock but even if it's not fuel but you need the chemical itself right so ethanol isn't just a fuel it's used for many other things you can get butanol a lot of things you can get certainly you know oil uh, is used for many things beyond uh, making biodiesel, for example. So there's opportunities to look at getting high value products out of your crops and uh, not sacrificing too much of your, uh, you know, food supply chain there. So I guess one, uh, let me see, we have a few more minutes, but um, there is one more question. I'm going to pose it right here before I ask one. Uh, given the very long timelines of breeding, how do you anticipate needs? Are there think tanks or blue sky breeding sessions? It's a very good question. So I'll, I'll uh, maybe start with Kurt. How would you see these uh, long timelines affect your uh, strategies when it comes to your program? Well, I, 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 the breeders do talk about these things I, to a certain degree, particularly at the variety registration meetings that are held every year. Uh, so there are there's discussions about these these topics. Uh, 
And then I think each individual breeder also has their own thoughts on where things maybe ought to go. And maybe they don't always share it with everybody else with those, then maybe they want to have a competitive advantage <laughs> to move on to something quick, quicker than someone else. Um, I guess for me, I think there's been quite a bit of talk in, in wheat about alternate alternative dwarfing genes. Uh, the green revolution genes that have really reduced the plant height of, of the wheat crop um, for protecting the crop from lodging. Um, these genes are associated with shorter coleoptiles and uh, they're also associated with increased fusarium pet blight um, disease in the field. So I think there, there, there are now additional genes which have been identified in wheat that, that could have some value. And I think, I know other breeders are, are interested in these genes and, and, and seeing if they can utilize them to swap them out or almost to see if we can create a crop that would be um, able to emerge from soil a little bit deeper. So you can see maybe a little bit deeper into the, the moisture in the soil. And, um, and possibly in the case of winter wheat, you might also be able, if you're seeded a little deeper, as long as it emerges relatively quickly, it may protect it from the winter as well. So that'd be something that'd be interesting to look at from a, a combined breeding and agronomic sort of study. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's lots of opportunities there, I think. And Rob, when you make decisions on uh, what your next steps might be or five years down the line, uh, whatever it might be for your program, uh, how do you decide on those things? You know, there must be so many options you can pursue, right? So um, is there a, a place to go, uh, you know, conversations to be had with people on uh, what's next? I think so. Uh, I, you definitely have to have a vision. I think you have to be aware of what's happening in agriculture as a whole agriculture on the global scale you know some challenge that they might be having in a different production area of the world you can maybe anticipate that that might be coming here or has been here depending upon the situation i think as as kurt said at different variety registration meetings or different conferences seeing what challenges they're experiencing in other crops i think those are all all mechanisms that you can hopefully use to formulate that that vision of what's going to be coming 10 20 years down the road Right. Yeah. And I, I think we are not getting away from the climate variability discussion. Right. And that affects so many things. And I'm sure that you are all thinking about uh, drought and flood resistance, disease resistance. Uh, yield is always important, but uh, lower inputs, you know, lower emissions, mitigation, all that stuff. I, I, I think that's going to be with us for a long time. So that sets up some guardrails anyway on, on what area you might want to look at. But uh, so many considerations. Um, I'm looking at my question list. I think we are uh, we are uh, good. We don't have any more questions at this point. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that we are almost out of time. So um, I just wanted to make sure that I uh, thank Kurt, Manika, and Rob for joining us today and graciously spending some time answering questions. I think this was a great discussion. I certainly enjoyed it and uh, very much appreciate uh, you spending this time with us. Uh, we are certainly working on future faculty conversations, so please uh, stay, stay tuned for details. Uh, you can watch for notices on what comes next on our social media accounts or by visiting makemanitoba.ca. And if you do not already receive our uh, newsletter, Aggie News, uh, please email us at agfoodside at umanitoba.ca and sign up. And uh, that will do it for today. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And have a great night. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.